<laughs> I hear you. <laughs> Okay, so we're streaming on YouTube and Okay, so we're streaming on YouTube and Am I good to go, Ed? Am I good to go, Ed? Let me uh, give me a couple seconds. I'll press start on the cable channel. Five Am I seconds. Good to go? Hey everyone. Hi, Chip. I apologize. Okay, Mayor. Hey everyone. Hi, Chip. Okay. Hi, Susan. Ed, we're getting a we're getting a feedback, just you know. Okay. Good evening. The school committee business meeting of May eleventh, twenty twenty, will now come to order. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March twelfth, twenty twenty order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the Governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather on place. This meeting in the Methuen School Committee is being conducted via remote participation. Madam Secretary, can you please call the roll? Ryan DeZoglio? Here. Karen Hallbauer? Here. Jessica McLeod? Here. Susan Nicholson? Here. Luann Santos? Here. Janazami Pesh? Present. Mayor Neil Perry. Here. Okay, all present. So we also have a number of individuals present. Uh, we have the superintendent, Brandy Kwong. We have the assistant superintendent, uh, Chip McGee. We have the business manager, Ian Goslin. There you are, Ian. Uh, we have Mr. Edward Lucia from Technology. We also have Ms. Caitlin Jalbert, the student representative. We have Deidre Runge, the recorder. Hi, Deidre. Um, we have Joanna Fawcett from the English Learner Department. We have Ken, De, my apologies, up front. Ken Dan Go, the SOAR Award winner. We have Kevin Geary from the Special Education Department. We have Ian Buckley, a SOAR Award winner. We have Chris Buckley, Ian's dad, proud dad, I should say. Uh, we have Katie Proietti, the CGS principal. We have Cheryl Bradley, the CGS teacher. We have Rebecca Gordon, the Marsh principal and Christine Maloney, a Marsh teacher. We have Richard Barden, uh, Methuen High School principal, and Bernard Stansbury, a Methuen High School teacher, Mary Beth Donovan, Tenney principal, and Jessica Leal, a Tenney teacher. We have Christopher Reeve, Timothy principal, and we have Colleen Muller, a Timothy teacher. Uh, anybody else who I didn't name alphabetically? So um, saying that, can I have a motion to ac accept the agenda? So moved. Moved Second. by Member Nicholson, seconded by Member Santos. Um, discussion. So at this time, we need to amend the agenda uh, and we need to add uh, 4B for an FY21 budget discussion. Can I get a motion to add uh, Section 4B to tonight's agenda? Moved. Oh, I got moved by Ryan Dezogli, seconded by Member Bazzani Pesci. Any discussion? All right, can we get a roll call, Madam Secretary? Ryan DeZoglio? Yes. Karen Halbauer? Yes. Jessica McLeod? Yes. Susan Nicholson? Yes. Louis, um, Susan Nicholson and did Luann Santos? Yes. Jane Azani Petch? Yes. Mayor Neil Perry? Yes. And so now we need to mo a motion to accept the agenda as amended, please. So, so moved. moved. Moved by Member Halbauer. Okay. Second by Member Santos. Any discussion on that? We'll go to roll call right away, please. Ryan DeZoglio? Yes. Karen Hallbauer? Yes. Jessica McLeod? Yes. Susan Nicholson? Yes. Luann Santos? Yes. Jane Azani Peck? Yes. Manuel Perry? Yes. Okay, outstanding, unanimous. Let's move on to the flag salute. Do we have somebody for that? Superintendent, or we pick someone? Um, we'll just pick a member to do the flag salute tonight. All right. Anybody have a strong desire to want to do the flag salute? I can't because I can't get up with my leg. So I'll pick member McLeod. 
thank you for that honor. You're welcome. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States, States of America, of America and to the Republic, Republic which is for which it stands, one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty and, and justice, justice for all. all. Outstanding job, Member McLeod. I'm very proud of you. So, all right, that takes us to participation by others. Superintendent, do you want to do the SOAR award? I do. So, I'd like to call in uh, Mr. Lucier, if you could allow uh, Joanna Fawcett, the department head for um, our language, English language learners, and her SOAR award winner. Um, yeah, and I, don't, I hope I don't say it wrong either, but can. Can Dan know? And Mr. Barden. Hi, Ms. Fawcett, how are you? Okay. Barden, how are you? And then we're just waiting for the student. Dr. Kwong, I don't see the student in the waiting room. May have just joined, hold on. She was working tonight and she was trying to get the appropriate time off from, um, from her boss. I can see her on the screen. I just allowed a student in, but it didn't have a name. Gone down. Oh yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Go ahead, Joanna. All right. Thank you. Kandan Ngo is being recognized as a SOAR Award recipient because of the dedication to academic success she has displayed since arriving in Methuen right before Thanksgiving 2018. Kandan may have come to Methuen from Vietnam with limited English proficiency, but she arrived with the desire to be successful. She currently has a 3.9 GPA. Kandan passed all of her MCAS within the first five months of being in Methuen. She earned a 230 in biology and a 240 in both math and ELA when she took it for the first time. When Kandan came to Methuen High School almost two years ago, she was placed in our beginner English language development courses. From the moment she arrived in late November of her junior year, Kandan demonstrated her dedication and drive to succeed. Her academic efforts were such that she moved ahead three proficiency levels and takes our courses for those who are expanding their English proficiency in her senior year. When Kandan started here at Methuen High School, she was the only Vietnamese speaker in our beginner English learner program. However, she did not let the obstacle of language stop her from creating friendships with speakers of other languages, excelling academically and advocating for herself. Kandan's teachers have only the kindest and warmest words to share about their experiences of working with her. Mrs. Lefebvre shared that, quote, Kandan was always a very conscientious student. She would challenge herself by writing something that pushed the limits of her English. What stood out the most about Kandan to Mrs. Lefebvre when thinking about having her in class was her openness and willingness to work and work with others. Ms. Stu Hamill had the following to say about Kandan. I am honored and proud to know her. She is an amazing person who makes the world a better place. She was in my science topics, English 1 and ELD classes her first year in the United States. Kandan quickly proved to be an exemplary student moving from level one to level four in one year. Her determination to succeed, intelligence and motivation both in and out of the classroom is evident to everyone who knows her. She is not only a dedicated student, she is a kind person. Kandan has always, always has a smile on her face and goes above and beyond to help anyone in need. She genuinely cares about others and makes them feel valued and special. She is admired, loved, and respected by both staff and students. Kandan will be attending Middlesex Community College in the fall. We wish her the best of luck in her future studies, but her teachers know she doesn't need luck. She will accomplish all of her goals because she is driven and motivated. So, Kandan, do you want to say a few words? Yeah. But I'm sorry, what did you say? Because I think we caught my signal, so I can hear you clearly. Do you want to just say a few words for us? 
about what Ms. Fawcett just shared and your experience at Methuen High School? Oh, yes. Kandan, what was your experience at Methuen High School? Oh, the first thing I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think I, will, I love this school. This school is so amazing. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, uh, I don't know how to explain it, but, but the teacher was nice. Uh, like Miss Foster, she was very nice to me. And Miss Duhamel, and, uh, and also Mr. Nevada. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Thank you, Kandan, congratulations. Congratulations, Kandan, congratulations. Kandan. congratulations. Thank, you. Oh, thank you. Congratulations, Kandan. Yay. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, so our next, um, our next faculty member would be Kevin Geary from the Special Education Department and Ian Buckley, student, and Chris Buckley, his dad. And Mr. Barden should stay on. Hi, Mr. Geary. Ian, nice to see you. Good. Oh, Mr. Geary, so we can't hear Mr. Geary. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Take two. Uh, I am pleased to announce Ian Buckley as this year's SOAR Award recipient. Ian is the son of Christopher Buckley and Jacqueline Buckley. Over the past four years, Ian has demonstrated significant academic achievement and personal growth. He has taken ownership of his learning differences, learned, developed, and utilized strategies to compensate and overcome them, all while exuding positivity and enthusiasm toward others. Ian has always presented as friendly and outgoing and his extroverted nature has endeared him not just to peers, but to teachers as well. In his English class, he is often the first one to participate in class discussions and is often a leader in class, according to his teacher, Christine Dumont. His cold, more elective teacher, Brendan Cripps, describes Ian as possessing, quote, an unmatched maturity in a way of relating to adults that is very uncommon in a high school student. I often felt that Ian and I were working together rather than a teacher-student capacity, unquote. Although his oral language skills have long been an area of strength for Ian, it is, work, it is his work ethic and drive to improve himself, learn new knowledge, and develop new skills that makes him the well-rounded individual he has become. In addition to his comment about Ian's maturity and relating to adults, Mr. Cripps also calls Ian, quote, one of the hardest workers I had for a semester. His hard work is especially notable in mathematics, which has long been an area of challenge for Ian. During his four years of high school, he has been taking more challenging math courses and responding to the expectations with his hard work. His geometry teacher, Mr. Fazioli, describes Ian as, quote, always laser focused on the task at hand. I could always tell he was paying attention because he would ask specific questions about the work, and I really appreciated that about him. I knew he was always trying to get better at math. He definitely takes pride in his education. Ian intends to attend Northern Essex Community College in the fall and then go on to earn a bachelor's degree in four years time. He has certainly demonstrated the desire and the work habits to achieve this goal, and he will be missed at Methuen High School. Ian is perhaps best summed up by the words from his guidance counselor, Simon McCaffrey, as quote, consistently hardworking, polite, positive, and conscientious, with a quick wit and a warm sense of humor, an absolute joy to be around. Our department is proud and honored to recognize a young man with the perspicacity and joie de vie of Ian Buckley as one of two interdisciplinary SOAR Award recipients for 2020. Congratulations, Ian. Nice job, Ian. So nice job, Ian. I'm, I'm very proud of you. Known you since you were a young lad. So it's nice to see you here tonight. Do you have a few words that you want to say to the group and to those watching? So, I've been unmuted. There you go. <laughs> so, um, you know, I've been in, you know, low level math classes, but I've, you know, gone up. I'm now in a geometry class. I've overcome my diversity. And, uh, you know, I guess I'm pretty great. 
<laughs> and then a whole award for me. But um, you know, it's all thanks to all my math teachers and skills teachers for, you know, helping me out. Even the uh, math MCAS, I failed the first time, but then got, I believe, a 240 the second time I tried it. So that's pretty great. And um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Congratulations, Ian. Congratulations, Ian. Congratulations, Ian. Okay, so next we have the Teacher of the Year Awards. Um, so we'll be calling up the principals and their Teacher of the Year in order. So the first principal is Katie Proetti from the CGS and the Teacher of the Year from the CGS, Cheryl Bradley. And Mr. Lucier, if you can allow them to join us. Oh, there's Miss Bradley. And I see Katie's, Miss Proetti's logo. I don't see her face, however. There she is. Hi. <laughs> All right, Miss Proetti. So do you want to introduce your teacher of the year and then she'll have an opportunity to say a few words? Certainly, it's nice to see you all digitally. So when discussing the candidate to choose the Comprehensive Grammar School 2019-2020 Educator of the Year, our administrative team worked unanimous, uh, unanimously nominated Cheryl Bradley. Mrs. Bradley is an enthusiastic teacher who works diligently to positively impact the lives of CGS students and families every day. Cheryl is a true people person and her investment in them is unmatched. Cheryl has been an active part of the CGS community for over 20 years. Shortly after her children became school-aged, Cheryl enrolled in graduate school, attending Lesley University to obtain her master's in elementary education. Recognizing her dedication and commitment to students, she was quickly hired at the CGS for a teaching position. She became the SAD coordinator and then assumed the role of third grade teacher. Cheryl has been a CGS teacher for 18 years. Every day, Cheryl demonstrates the importance of meeting students' needs and building spirits with encouragement and support. To this point, one of her students commented, Mrs. Bradley is so positive. She wants us to learn, and I mean really learn. She wants to make sure we finally get it, not just today, but for tomorrow. He added, she gives us lots of references and visual, visuals, handouts, and helpful websites to make sure we know it. Cheryl truly cares about the whole child and works to ensure her students feel important and successful. I've witnessed occasions where Mrs. Bradley's supportive demeanor has encouraged a reluctant student. These interactions happen often and are critical to the success of her students. During her time as a teacher, Cheryl has also worked with programs to support, to support students and families in need. Her work with SAD, the mentor program, the non-ODR team, and the CGS backpack program, which feeds over 40 families per week, is impressive. In addition, Mrs. Bradley has taken on the role of CGS liaison for Debbie's treasure chest. Mrs. Bradley is known and respected throughout the CGS community. She's always available to administration and colleagues whenever a need arises. One of her colleagues eagerly shared, Cheryl has taken me under her wing since day one and has been my rock ever since, always by my side. She is a mentor and a cheerleader and always has my back. Her guidance and training has been second to none, which that's lovely. As noted, Mrs. Bradley's influence on the school community is positive and inspiring. Her energy, optimism, and positive spirit are contagious. It is an honor to work with her and to nominate her for the 2019-20 CGS Teacher of the Year. Congratulations, Cheryl. Thank you, Katie. I remember that day very well, 18 years ago, Ms. Bradley. So do you have a few words that you'd like to share tonight? I do. I do. First, I wanna say, Ian Buckley, you are amazing. I am so proud of where you are. He was one of my former students as well. Just love him. So Ian. So Cheryl, you're breaking up a, a bit. We can't really hear you that well. My first person to be this when I moved to Mount ten years ago. 
I met my husband when I was in high school, and we basically Okay. Page two. Can you hear me now? I know she's trying to move right now. Hmm. All right. I'm going to close to my internet. Am I coming in now? No, um, Cheryl, we, it's really hard. I wonder if you um, jump off and then you try, we'll have um, Rebecca Gordon do sit with Christine and then we'll have you come back on just to see if the connection's better if you jump back on. I don't want to miss what you're trying to say. Position. Am I coming in yet? Not yet. Yeah, we can't, we still can't hear you. So we'll jump off and then, yeah, okay. All right, so thank you, Katie. We'll, we'll have You're her welcome. jump back on, okay? I don't want to oh, miss what she's trying thank to you. say. Yep. All right, so um, thank you. So we have the next principal, we have Rebecca Gordon coming on and we have Christine Maloney as the Marsh Teacher of the Year this year. Actually, I'm going to change that. Ms. Prowetti reminded me it's the Educator of the Year, not the Teacher of the Year. All, all educators, yeah. Ms. Gordon, welcome. Whoa. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Ms. Maloney's here too? She's coming on here momentarily. There she is. Hi. Hi, Ms. Maloney. Hi. It is with extreme pleasure and excitement that Christine Maloney is our Marsh Teacher of the Year. Ms. Maloney is one of our lower school pathway special education teachers and is a valued member of the special education team as well as the entire school community. When thinking about why Ms. Maloney deserves the recognition of Teacher of the Year, the following thoughts immediately surface. Her strong knowledge base and understanding of students with autism, her willingness to take on and succeed in difficult situations, and her ability to be a strong mentor to our colleagues in general education, special education, and within the substantially separate programs. Ms. Maloney has a tremendous passion and skill set with working with unique needs of students with an autism diagnosis. She recognizes and embraces that each student will require different supports or interventions and works tirelessly to make sure those supports are successful across all settings. She is always advocating for her students' best interest to everyone that is part of that child's team, including parents, guardians, administration, outside, and district providers. And sometimes, as we know, that's no easy task. Ms. Maloney does not shy away from a challenging or contentious situation. Her thought process is always what is best and most appropriate for the student. She keeps this in the forefront of all of her decisions, ideas, and interactions. Families and outside providers always comment on Ms. Maloney's support of their child. As our Pathways program is rapidly expanding, Ms. Maloney has taken the initiative to be a strong mentor and consistent person within the program. New teachers, as well as veteran general education and special education teachers, seek her out for advice and support as the needs of our students are constantly changing. Everyone recognizes Ms. Maloney's strong ability to meet the needs and provide differentiated supports to her students. And because of this, it's not uncommon for her colleagues to use her as a sounding board as they work to support their own students. She has provided professional development to the entire school staff on the social thinking curriculum as a way for us to utilize common language across um, all settings within the building. She has been a great resource for her colleagues as they have been implementing the social thinking vocabulary. As you can see, Ms. Maloney has all the attributes of an exemplary teacher, mentor, colleague, and student advocate. The entire Marsh community is lucky to have her as part of our team. Thank you, Ms. Maloney. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Gordon. Um, Ms. Maloney, would you like to say a few words tonight? Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to thank the, the Marsh administration for the recognition. Um, very, very, very um, surprising. Um, I want to thank the 
amazing team of people that work in my room, with my room, next door to my room. Um, I couldn't do it without them. They make me a better person, um, my family. But the, the true spotlight would be my students. Um, what they allow me to do every day um, is amazing. They, their perseverance teaches me daily. Um, just, it's a true calling. I think what I do is not just a job. It's really what I was, it's my purpose. And um, I feel fortunate every day that I do it. I love my job and that's it. Thank you. Awesome. Congratulations, Christine. That's wonderful. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Gordon. So I think we have Ms. Bradley back. Ms. Bradley, we'll give this a second try. Take two. Um, Take two. In case you missed this, Ian Buckley, I was trying to say I am so proud of you. You're one of my former students too, and I, I'm just glowing watching you on TV. Wonderful. Um, and Dr. Kong, I do remember you were my person that hired me. It's a it's just a it's a beautiful circle that we uh, that we come through. Um, so now I'm ready to talk officially. I thought I was, but um, thank you for this great honor. The story as a person began in Methuen, where I moved to when I was 10 years old. I met my husband at Methuen High School. We raised a beautiful family here in Methuen. In fact, I lived less than a mile from my beloved school, CGS, which proved useful for the late night runs back to school to complete curriculum and such. As a teacher, my story started in September of 1999 when my oldest child, Courtney, began kindergarten. I wanted to be involved in her school so I volunteered for a program called Mavis, Mothers Against Violence in Schools. One day after one of my many lessons with the children, her teacher, Mrs. LaPlante said, have you ever thought of becoming a teacher? And I said, me, no. <laughs> I revered teachers and never ever thought I could move to that level. But that was my nudge. I could be a teacher. Testing this notion, I started as a substitute teacher two years later when my son began kindergarten. I found I loved each different classroom. I loved the kids. I love the school. I found I love teaching. I enrolled myself in a weekend format. I obtained my master's, passed the many tests that are needed, um, received my license, and as Mrs. Poyetti, um, I think Mrs. Poyetti, um, and Ms. Kwan officially hired me in 2004. Along my teaching travels, I have taught and been in the humble shadows of the greatest of staff. Throughout these years, I saw my children grow, my personal children grow and complete eighth grade in the same beautiful school, move on to Methuen High School and complete their college degrees. Now in the twilight of my teaching year, I received this humbling award. My heart is full, but I have truly come full circle. I accept this award for all of my students who worked hard, put up with my, I'm not giving up on you, and, um, and I'm not taking my hand off your shoulder until the last day you're with me, which had some good and bad effects. <laughs> it is their beautiful young spirits, their determination, their grit, their highs and lows that make teaching so rewarding. This is where true teaching happens. When we treat their young minds respectfully, for they are at times fragile, telling them we care and we all have bad days. Tomorrow will be better. They are the fuel to make us all better teachers. I wish I could cut this award in minuscule pieces and hand each one of my students Ian Buckley being one of them, a piece, but they put me here in front of you today. They deserve the credit. I always tell my students when they become rich and famous, give me a shout out while on stage. Well, I'm not rich and famous, but today I give them a shout out because this award for them. Thank you. Congratulations, Cheryl, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we have the next principal on deck. We have Mary Beth Donovan from the Tenney Grammar School, and we have Jessica Leal, eighth grade Tenney Teacher of the Year, Educator of the Year. So we're heading on in now. Hi, Jessica. Hi. Mary Beth will be on in one moment. Sorry. Hello, hello everyone. There she is. <laughs> Hi, Mary Beth, hello. welcome. Nice to see everyone. Nice to see you. And what, oh, that, sorry, that's my dog saying hello as well. I apologize. 
Um, it's such a pleasure to introduce Jess Leal as our 2020 Tenney Teacher of the Year. Jessica makes such a positive impact on the goings on on our school every single day. She sees the beauty in mathematics and shares that with such enthusiasm. She knows the potential of all her students and provides them with the tools and strategies they need to realize it. Jess understands the power of collaboration and is a valued teammate because she is so generous with her knowledge of pedagogy, curriculum, and student data, and is always willing to learn from her peers. Jessica joined the Tenney in 2006 after working in Lawrence Public Schools. She has worked for 14 years at the Tenney teaching math and algebra to seventh and eighth graders and she's coordinated our Continental Math League, which offers mathematical challenges to students. And she helps create interventions to support students who need additional strategies in order to succeed. And I'd like to note that the good work has continued during shutdown. Jess continues to find ways to reach your students, like mailing notes of encouragements to her kids, cheering them on to reach new goals, like one of our, including in one of our math goals. This week, her students logged 1,300 hours of practice, and she's hosted a number of online meetings with her teams. Jessica also devotes herself to providing students with opportunities to serve our community. For example, she's taken over the role of Students Against Destructive Decisions Advisor, and the group has grown so significantly under her direction. Most recently, Jessica and her SAD students helped provide meals to almost 500 Tenney families in time of need during the holidays. And we're very proud that the SAD students now join our Junior National Honor Society and Student Council and peer leader members to march in our veterans and Memorial Day parades. She also serves as an advisor to a number of other clubs, including yearbook and bowling. For several years, Jessica has worked as a mentor for our new teachers. She has been invaluable in that role guiding our newest staff members as they navigate their first year of teaching. She models good teaching, helps troubleshoot areas of concern, and most significantly, goes into the new teacher's rooms to observe, support, critique, and always, always, always support. Her input is trusted by staff and administration. One of her teammates, Sarah Calla, uses the words patient and generous when describing Jessica. Ms. Calla noted that while Jessica devotes every minute of the school day to support learning, she takes time to be a contributing member of the teaching team and support her colleagues as well. The students are so lucky to have Jessica as a teacher. Her colleagues are lucky to have her as a colleague. Jessica received her undergraduate degree from Salem State and her master's from Cambridge College. She's bilingual. And Jessica and Jamie Hicks are parents to Reese, who is a CGS student, and Lucas, who will be joining CGS as a kindergarten student next year. Um, Dr. Kwong, I know we have a lot of Tenney staff and parents and students watching right now because I've been deluge with a request for the link to this. <laughs> so I know they're sharing with us and just we're so proud. Thank you for everything. Awesome. Thank you. Nice job. Jessica? Yes. Can you hear me? Words. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, thank you so much to Mrs. Donovan, Ms. Simone, and Mrs. Goyette. Um, this recognition really means a lot to me. Um, I must say too that I owe so much of this to my amazing teammates who inspire me literally every single day. That's Doug, Chris, Kathy, Sarah, Brandon, Kelly, and Steph. I um, truly wouldn't be recognized without the support of my team and especially the Tenney administration. Um, I've always known that I wanted to be a teacher, and in fact, I have vivid memories of playing school with my cousin when I was younger. Um, and then growing up in Methuen, I always envisioned teaching back in Methuen, and that dream for me came true in 2006 when Mr. Jim Juca hired me at the Tenney. Um, I consider myself very lucky to teach there. You know, there's something to be said about doing what you love and loving what you do, and I that's exactly what happens every single day for me. Um, I really would also love to thank my beautiful family, um, but most of all, my former and my current students, because without them, I mean, they literally have impacted my life forever. So thank you so much. I sincerely um, appreciate this recognition.
Great. Congratulations, Jess. Thank you. Nice job. Yay. I know it's hard to, it's hard. Hard. In, in, in the Zoom world, but congratulations. Wonderful. <laughs> well you. deserved. <laughs> and, and thank you, Mary Beth. Thank you. All right, our next recipient, we have Mr. Barden, uh, Methuen High School principal, and Bernie Stansberry, our Methuen High School uh, educator for our, he's the, uh, the uh, current, I always get this wrong, Colonel? Lieutenant Colonel. Lieutenant Colonel. Lieutenant Colonel. Lieutenant Colonel, sorry, Bernie Stansberry, uh, for our JROTC program. So welcome tonight. And Mr. Barden, it's all you. First off, it's nice to see everybody, and I hope everybody's doing well. It's my time seeing you, school committee, um, in a number of weeks. So thank you for all that you're doing for our students during the school closure. Um, it gives me great pleasure to announce Senior Army Instructor Lieutenant uh, Colonel Bernie Stansberry for the prestigious award of Methuen High School Educator of the Year. Colonel Stansberry is a veteran JROTC teacher, a knowledgeable department leader, and a well-respected member of our faculty at Methuen High School. Colonel Stansberry serves as an outstanding model for our students. Leading by example, Colonel regularly goes beyond his duties by organizing numerous JROTC after school and weekend events, providing students with SAT preparation and supporting our students at all extracurricular activities. Each year, living by his motto, Rangers Lead the Way, Colonel had his students post the colors for a dozen of events, participate in numerous flag replacement ceremonies, and march in multiple parades. Colonel Stansberry commits to his students year round by supporting their preparation and development at JROTC Cadet Leadership Challenge, known as JCLC, camps in the summer, drill competitions in the fall, map competitions in the winter, and Raiders competitions in the spring. In his spare time, Colonel Stansberry can be found on the sidelines of MHS sporting events cheering on our students. The Colonel's affable and approachable nature enables him to work well with students of all abilities who benefit greatly from the model lessons and educational leadership the Colonel consistently designs and delivers. Likewise, Colonel Stansberry is a valuable resource for new teachers as he models commitment and dedication to our JR JROTC program. He is always willing to donate his time and share sound educational practices with his fellow colleague, Army Instructor Sergeant First Class, Sean Kelly. Colonel has worked diligently to grow and sustain Methuen High School's JROTC program, which has been recognized as, a, as an honor unit with distinction, the highest ranking for 21 consecutive years. In his classroom, Colonel Stansberry routinely demonstrates many of the qualities that make him an effective leader. He combines strong intellect with patience and empathy. He listens to his students with genuine interest. Colonel's abilities to hear ideas, assess their value and contribute to discourse form the foundation of his teaching. As Colonel Stansberry observes his students and gathers information in both verbal and nonverbal forms, he evaluates what they know, what they don't know, and what he can do to clarify their understanding. Colonel Stansberry is a reflective teacher. He focuses and, uh, he, he, his focus and attentive style set a professional and collaborative tone in which students respond. As a result, Colonel Stansberry's students feel supported and secure as evidenced by their willingness to ask questions, offer ideas, take risks, and learn from mistakes. Colonel Stansberry is the type of educational leader that every school needs. He is poised and knowledgeable professional who provides stability by promoting the school's mission with consistency. A collaborative colleague, Colonel takes great interest in the ideas of others while accepting and reflecting on feedback in the best interest of the school and his students. Most importantly, Colonel focuses on supporting, nurturing, and motivating his students so they can realize their potential. Colonel Stansberry has proven to be a versatile educator and one that teaches parents, and one that teachers, parents, students, and administrators hold in high esteem. It is, it is without reservation that I wholeheartedly uh, recommend Senior Army Instructor Lieutenant Colonel Stansberry for the prestigious award of Methuen High School Educator of the Year. Congratulations, Lieutenant Colonel Stansberry. Congratulations, Bernie. Thank you. Outstanding, well deserved. If you'd like to say a few words. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Barden, and uh, your entire team, uh, the administ MHS administration, for this uh, great recognition and uh, great honor. Um, I'm humbled to receive this award, knowing the high quality that we have there of teachers at Methuen High School. 
I tell my students that I wake up early every morning and uh, eagerly look forward to going to school. Uh, we usually open up the school right behind the custodians at 6 a.m. in the morning and my cadets are shortly uh, thereafter either waiting for me sometimes or right there right around 6.10 uh, and we start our staff planning very early. Uh, it's my primary goal to see them succeed in life in whatever profession they decide to embark on. It's a great feeling when you're doing something you truly love to do and I feel so fortunate and blessed to work at Methuen High School. I could not have chosen a better career after retiring from the military. I'd also like to take just a brief moment to recognize the JRTC Teacher of the Year, Mr. Brendan Cripps, who was chosen by the senior cadets and was supposed to be recognized at our military ball this year. Mr. Cripps is the only teacher to receive that award twice, and I look forward to presenting him his plaque when we return to school. Thank you again for this great honor. Thank you, nice job. Congratulations again, Lieutenant Colonel. Nice job. Okay, so last but not least, we have Principal Christopher Reed from the Timoney, and we have Colleen Muller, the Timoney Teacher of the Year, and Colleen also was the Salem Methuen Rotary Teacher of the Year. Unfortunately, we didn't get to celebrate with the Methuen Rotary, Salem Rotary, um, but we are hopeful and excited to be able to present uh, her work tonight. And I see both of them, I believe here, Chris, Mr. Reeve is present yep. and Ms. Muller, yeah. All right, Mr. Reeve, well, if you'd like to uh, read your piece on Ms. Muller, that'd be great. Sure, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm very, very excited um, to make my first presentation of Educator Year at the Timoney Grammar School. Um, such a wonderful staff over there. It was really kind of hard for me um, to select um, just one person. Uh, but when I sat down to think about it this year, and I'm re I just reread, obviously, what I wrote, and it just seems like a lifetime ago. I could add about 12 more pages, but I didn't. Um, you know, one person really jumped to mind. And so I'm very proud to present wow. Colleen Muller, second grade teacher for the 2020 Educator of the Year at the Donald P. Timoney Grammar School. Colleen's been a member of the Methuen Public Schools since 2009. And in her 11 year tenure, she's proven to be a model educator and a friend to the Timoney community. In her main role as a second grade teacher, Colleen's commitment and dedication to every student's growth and development is evident as soon as you walk into her classroom. It is clear that Colleen knows her learners and provides many opportunities for them to succeed. Colleen possesses a unique ability to make all students feel valued for their strengths, not defined by their needs and creates a safe, active learning environment where students can take risks and explore the curriculum. When discussing the progress of her students, <clears throat> excuse me, Colleen bursts with excitement, celebrating each achievement. Colleen wears the pride for her students in the form of a wonderful smile each day. However, a dedication to her students does not stop when the lessons of the day are done. She cares about her students well beyond the end of the school day. A recent example occurred right before the winter break this year. Like all the schools in Methuen, the Timoney community works together to help support our families during the holiday season. One particular family in Colleen's class was a recipient of some support for the holidays. In a terrible turn of events, this family's car was stolen just days before the break while parked at the shelter in which they lived. All of the items that were purchased for the family were lost. Colleen was distraught upon hearing this from the mother of their student. Instead of leaving it there, Colleen, with the help of our tremendous Timothy staff, replaced everything and more for this family in time for the holidays. In my many conversations with Colleen, oh, I think we lost him. I know. I think we did too. The BIS team, the school council, and our student intervention team, to name a few. <clears throat> she is a great teammate. Listen to what Colleen's colleagues had to say about, I don't know who was more excited. I'm taking a little pause here for my speech. <laughs> I don't know who was more excited about Colleen winning this award. Colleen, um, and deservedly so, or her team, um, who 
were chomping at the bit to tell her to tell her to tell her. And I said, no, you have to wait, you have to wait, you have to wait. But they did a wonderful job in keeping the surprise. But listen to some of what Colleen's colleagues had to say about her. Colleen is the most selfless colleague and a friend I know. She is willing to share her time, ideas, material, and love of teaching with every single student and staff member she comes in contact with. She truly is the best teammate and friend. She deserves this so much. She always goes above and beyond in everything she does. She always has the best interests of her kids and families in mind every day. Colleen has a huge heart. <clears throat> Colleen has been an absolute amazing friend and teacher. She shares everything. She cares so much about the children in her class and all of us as colleagues. Colleen will go above and beyond for any student, team member, or staff member. We are a team because she is the glue. And since I've started on the team six years ago, she's the first, she's the first one in and the last one to leave to ensure that she's prepared to give her students the best learning experience she can. She's just an overall amazing teacher, friend, and coworker, and mother. Colleen should be commended for her enthusiasm for the profession and her dedication to the students at the Timoney School. So it is my pleasure uh, to present Ms. Colleen, Mrs. Colleen Muller as the Donald P. Timoney's Educator of the Year. I don't know if I can add the second piece, but <laughs> I know there's another, there's another part to that. There is, and I, I just announced it. So Colleen, you, you are also the Methuen Salem Rotary Teacher of the Year to represent Methuen. So congratulations. Thank we you. We celebrate with you, um, but we'll do it here for now and hope that in the coming months we will be able to do it in person. Um, but this is your opportunity, so well-deserved. Uh, if you wanna say a few words to the group and anybody who's watching uh, live stream or watching on TV tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is, um, it's a humbling, it's a humbling honor and an exciting honor both at the same time. Um, I think Mr. Reeves said it best when, when the announcement was made, um, I was caught very much off guard and was very surprised. Um, and my team was beyond excited for me. And I don't think that they make going to work to school every single day easy because of the people that I work with and the people that support me. Um, the administrative team in our building is wonderful. I love them. I love all my colleagues, but my grade two team specifically, we work so well together. We support each other. And, um, you know, there's there's so much that we do to support each other and support our kids and each other's kids in our classrooms every single day. And that one, um, that one, you know, awful issue that happened at Christmas time, um, we did support that kiddo and his family. And it wasn't just me, it was our entire school that sort of rallied after, you know, after their car got stolen. And um, we supported them and replaced the things that were stolen and then some. And it was just an amazing, amazing feeling to do that. And his mom, mom and he were so appreciative. So going to school every day is easy because I get to do something that I love every day. I live in this city. I live very close by to the Timoney. It's my community. It's my school community. And I just appreciate it so much. So thank you very much. Well deserved. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. Reeve, as well. And again, hopefully we'll be able to celebrate this in person, mm. but this is uh, at least tonight we were able to uh, celebrate with them our educator <coughs> of the year. So thank you again. Okay, Mr. Mayor, I believe that uh, chairperson, I guess that's the end of our uh, awards tonight. So I think we can go back to the agenda. Yep, yep. And I think that takes us to the Student Advisory Council. Uh, Caitlin, could we get an update for the council, please? Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so basically, what I'm talking about today is just kind of like how uh, students have been um, since the whole like, lockdown, not going to school. Um, being a senior myself, it's kind of difficult. Um, I've personally just been using this time to work a lot and work on my schoolwork. Um, but a lot of students are really, really upset about it. 
Um, and we're just trying to find new ways with our families and friends who kind of celebrate what we are trying to accomplish this year. Um, we had the whole like sign thing. I'm not sure exactly if that was the class officers um, who decided to do the sign. Um, I don't know if it's like the sign drive, but everyone, all the seniors have a little sign in their yard that says uh, class of 2020. And I've been driving around going to work and I've been seeing them in everyone's houses and kind of like, it's nice to see. Um, and then we also uh, decided not necessarily um, student council themselves, but I'm also part of the yearbook committee. Um, we've been adding a lot to the yearbook kind of to celebrate the seniors, um, like quarantine pages, which are very enjoyable. You're gonna like them, a lot of animals and dogs in them. Um, so that's kind of like how it's been. I mean, obviously the year ended not how we wanted it to, but um, so the students are getting by and yeah. <laughs> that's basically all I have to say. Okay. <laughs> Are, are you guys participating in the surveys that are going on regarding graduation and things like that? Yes, definitely. Um, I, like me, I have a twin brother, um, so we kind of get go through two of everything, but um, all my friends and I, everyone's like talking about like, even just like through like group chats and other seniors and friends are, we're all like talking about like what we think is best. Um, I also, I actually have a stepbrother in the eighth grade at the Tenney and he, having a lot of stuff there. So like even them themselves at the Tenney, I know he's getting a lot of connections back and forth about his like final like assembly, um, which he's actually really upset about too. So it's like, uh, everyone's kind of missing out and we're just trying to, every grade is trying to get like connections. So it's kind of bringing us really close together. Yep. In community. <laughs> okay, anybody else have any questions for Caitlin? And don't forget, you can use the raise your hand feature if you choose. Okay, so uh, thank you, Caitlin. Moving on. That takes us to public participation, which was posted as individuals that would like to participate in this meeting may do so in writing before 3 p.m. Monday, May 11th, 2020. Be emailed to derunge at methuen.k12.ma.us, which will be read to the public. There were no emails sent. So just a reminder, um, you can send by Monday, May 18th before 3 p.m. If you'd like one read at the workshop next week. So again, send an email to derunge at methuen.k12.ma.us before 3 p.m. next Monday if you want to be considered for public participation. And that takes us on to, uh, I need a motion to approve the minutes of the March 9th, 2020 business meeting. So moved. Second. By Member Santos, seconded by Member DeZargo. Any discussion? Hearing us seeing no hands raised, roll call, please. Ryan DeZaglio? Yes. Karen Halbauer? Yes. Jessica McLeod? Yes. Susan Nicholson? Member Nicholson, you're muted. There you go. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Luann Santos. Yes. Dana Zani Pesh. Yes. And Mayor Neil Perry. Yes. Okay. Unanimous. Now, moving on, I need a motion to approve the minutes of the March 16th, 2020 joint meeting with the City Council. Moved. Moved by Member Hallbauer, seconded by uh, Member Desogra. Thank you. Any discussion? It wasn't me that made the motion. Oh, so it's okay it, though. So just when you, so just if you don't yes. mute, it pops up in yellow, and that makes me think you spoke, right? So, <laughs> so see what I learned. So correct that to say, Member Desaglio moved. We have a second for that. I need somebody I'll, to second. I'll second it. I'll there second. There you go, it. Member Hallbaugh <laughs> second. So, so any discussion on the March sixteenth joint meeting? I thought you did an excellent job at this, Superintendent. But, um, any discussion? Hearing a seeing no raised hands, let's go to a roll call. Jody? Ryan DeZaglio? Yes. Karen Halbaugh? Yes. Jessica McLeod? Yes. Susan Nicholson? Present. Luann Santos? Yes. Dana Zani Pesh? Present. And Man Neil Perry? Present. And, and I'm sitting here, I'm struck by how much has changed since that meeting. 
I know. Seems like a lifetime ago, right? Remarkable, so, actually. It is when you think about it. It's just mm -hmm. stunning. Okay, I need a motion to approve the minutes of the. I'll pay attention. A motion to approve the minutes of the March thirtieth, twenty twenty workshop. So moved. Second. Moved by Member Pesci. Seconded by Member Dezaglio. Any discussion? Hearing a seeing none, Dodie, if we could go to the roll call. Ryan Dezaglio. Yes. Karen Halbauer. Yes. Jessica McLeod. Yes. Susan Nicholson. Pleasant. Luann Santos. Yes. Jane Azani Pesh. Yes. Daniel Perry. Present. And that's that. That's that. Yep. Okay. Uh, that takes us to the superintendent's COVID-19 update. Um, we've got an A and B part now with the amended agenda, just a reminder. So. Yeah, Glad so um, Mr. Barden is coming in now. So we will talk about the graduation memo in a moment. Um, I just have two other uh, updates for folks. I didn't write them down. They kind of have been coming in as we're, we, we already sent out the packet. Um, but a simple one and a very positive one is that our food, uh, food service a director received information from the USDA that we actually were awarded, um, uh, and I hope I say this right, Ian, jump in if I'm not saying this right, but um, so many boxes of fruits and vegetables to actually give to our students and families in need. Um, so we're really excited about that. So each week we will have fresh fruits and vegetables to put with our backpack program, which all of you are familiar with. Um, and that is, that is awesome um, that we're getting that at this point because we haven't been getting uh, as you can imagine, a lot of fr fresh food, fruits and vegetables for the lunch program uh, at this point. You know, it's mostly sandwiches and maybe apples and bananas, but not a lot of uh, mixed fruits. So we're excited about that. So I wanted to share that with you. We just got that word uh, yesterday, Friday, maybe. Um, and then the second thing is we just got word uh, over the weekend that the CARES Act grant uh, is coming in. We, we, I'll be sitting on a webinar this week. Um, regarding the funding and the use of funding. And we do have an opportunity to, uh, if we submit the grant by June 15th, we will be able to uh, use, subsidize some of the funds that we used for this during the closure. So um, I'm very much looking forward to um, using those funds to pay for the teacher Chromebooks um, that we moved in the, in the operating budget so that we can have that be a savings for next year. Um, so it is with every intent that I am going to work uh, diligently over the coming weeks with my team to make sure that we have uh, plans for that grant uh, and submit by June 15th so we can do that and have those funds available for FY21. Um, so that's, that's the plan. Uh, and as the plan progresses for the funding, I certainly will bring that forward to, to this group uh, as the team decides on how we're going to use those funds best. And again, those are supplemental funds to be used for uh, related costs to the closure, remote learning, uh, closing the achievement gap, uh, things like that uh, through next summer. Uh, and then there's a, which will be, I think more understood when, when we watch the webinar this week, um, there is a possibility of extension through 21-22, but it, it's quoted as an as needed, uh, as necessary or as needed. So those are some questions that I have at this point that hopefully will be answered this week. Uh, after we sit in on the webinar. So I just wanted to keep you close. Those are the two sort of newer things and they came in uh, after everything was sent home on Friday. So I just wanted to make sure you were aware. Um, but our big topic tonight, um, I'd like Mr. Barden to be able to share with you um, what our hopes are for the high school graduation so we can share that out with families and students uh, this week and start making plans. So Mr. Barden, welcome back. Hello everyone. Um, First and foremost, I just want to begin by acknowledging our, our, uh, all of our students. I miss seeing them. I miss being at work. I miss being in the building, um, especially to our, our seniors. Um, this has been especially difficult on them. Um, you know, I, I feel terrible that a lot of these wonderful things that happen traditionally at the end of their senior years, um, those, those have been either postponed or canceled, and uh, it's been extremely difficult time. I also want to just thank um, our class offices and our, um, uh, our co-advisors and our senior class assistant principal, uh, our class president, uh, Julian McCoy, our vice president, 
uh, Treasurer Brandon Lee, co-advisors uh, Mr. Sims and uh, Ms. O'Sullivan, and our senior class associate principal, uh, Ms. Thomas. Um, they, they did an outstanding job um, really just um, guiding this process and, and, and really making sure that we took into account as much information as we could um, and really got the feedback from our uh, class of 2020 seniors and, and family. So um, thank you so much to that group. Uh, as you can see from the memo that was shared, um, there's a very, very strong um, indication that our students want to postpone graduation uh, to July 31st um, with the hopes of, of um, social distancing and some of the regulations changing. So there is a possibility for an in-person in uh, graduation ceremony. Um, from, the, from, the, uh, from, that, from the results, you can see that 197 of our students and families selected out of um, 309 who responded for a percentage of 63.8%. Uh, a lot of the feedback in the survey was that um, students and families are really, really hoping to do something in person um, at our football, at, at Nicholson Stadium um, for, for our students to be um, with each other, celebrated um, with their families and, and, and out in the, uh, in the fresh air on the football field. Um, uh, also on that survey, we got, we, we got some information about prom and um, senior prom and students are hoping that again, that um, if allowed, they'd love to have um, a prom at some point in July um, where, they can, where they can celebrate their senior prom together. Um, so that was a pretty strong indication as well as 182 um, students and families out of 309 selected and that is 58.9%. Uh, so with, uh, with the approval tonight, um, we, uh, we, our team will work together and um, start making some plans. Um, I, I wanna be clear that of course, um, we will work to, if July 31st is the date, we will work as a team uh, to plan both an in-person um, commencement ceremony and we'll also work at the same time to plan a virtual ceremony um, because not knowing uh, with the uncertainty of, of the pandemic, um, we wanna be prepared and be able to, to put on a wonderful performance for our students and families. That's great, thank you, Rich. Um, so I think, you know, Mr. Barden has been working diligently uh, with the teams for the past several weeks on this. These are not easy decisions. And, uh, you know, I would support uh, this recommendation to postpone to July 31st, and that is the graduation date. I think that's what we're thinking, that if it is in person, that is wonderful and we will plan for it. Uh, but if it can't happen in person, that we will have a virtual graduation that same date so that we have a date in place and that the high school team and the students can plan um, for either. But we hope that we, this gives us an opportunity to have that, that date. And I think one of the things that I know Mr. Barden and I talked about, um, the kids picked July 31st, July 31st, Mr. Barden, purposely, right? And not went beyond that. Do you want to just talk about that for a minute and how strongly the students felt about that? Yeah, and a lot of the conversation, um, you know, because I, we, we wanted to make sure that students had a chance to to fully voice their their thoughts and in, in the um, in communicating with the advisors. Um, one concern is that um, there is that emotional separation where students want to be able to transition from high school and onto their post secondary plans. Um, so students largely wanted to to go into late July or early August. The rain date um, for this would be. Uh, August 1st. So you can see it's right at the, uh, at, the, at, at, the at the beginning of August. Um, and, and I think students um, largely wanted to make sure that they could go through this process and, and be celebrated and to celebrate with their peers, but also um, shortly thereafter start to transition to their post-secondary um, uh, opportunities. So those going on to college could be leaving in, in mid to early August. I know that there's a lot of question marks with what each institution will do with, with the pandemic. Um, but, uh, but students did, did seem to want to have that separation and, and some closure to their high school careers. Thank you. So I think at this time, um, you know, we're, I don't know if we need a vote of approval, but we're really looking at the blessing of the school committee to be able to um, move forward with planning because uh, the team is going to have some pretty intense planning for uh, this either virtual or in-person graduation for 450 kids. Um, so if there are questions from Mr. Barden or myself or, um, you know, comments, uh, I will take those now and then uh, just looking again for approval from the committee to move forward. So 
Does anybody have any questions? Oh, so uh, Member Pesci, Member Pesci yeah. yeah, you can use the raised hand. You don't. <laughs> Member Pesci has a question. Yes. Mayor, I have I have the raised hand up. Can you see oh, it? You do. Or no? It's not showing. Sure. Because it's, it, it's up on my screen. Okay. So I take I, it back. I was Member just Pesci. I was waving at everyone just to make. There sure. it is. It just came through. <laughs> um, I just. I just wanted to say thank you for doing this. I know there's been a lot of talk on social media about graduation and prom and what have you. And I can only imagine, I mean, we heard Caitlin speak. I can only imagine how devastating this is for the seniors. Um, so first and foremost, thank you for doing this for the families and for the students. Um, I think they need this sort of closure and they, they were really wanting to see something come out um, either way. So I think this, if it works out, I think it's really the best of both worlds. Um, allowing for you know public participation in a formal setting, but also if people still have those reservations, um, allowing for you know virtual attendance uh, attendance as well. So you have my support, my blessing. I think it's it's wonderful. Um, assuming as we know the situation is always fluid. Uh, assuming nothing changes, I'm hoping things continually uh, to get better and better. And the governor, you know, lessens restrictions and so forth. And I really hope for the seniors that this comes into play. And I just want to say thank you. And, and you have uh, my 100% approval of this. Thank you. Good job. Member McLeod has her hand raised. Thank you. Um, similar, uh, I, similarly, I just wanted to say that I, I greatly appreciate the collaborative nature of this decision. This is a hard choice to make. Um, and I think that it's only um, prudent to work with students and families to make the decision. Um, so certainly the majority, um, we need to recognize and honor what our community is asking for. And hopefully, of course, there'll be a turn and everything can go um, as planned with something uh, on July 31st with no rain date needed. Thank you. And member DeZoglo has his hand raised. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say um, I, you have my full blessing. As everybody knows, I've, I've talked to parents just as much as everybody else, and they wanted their children um, to have a voice, and I'm glad that that's what really made the decision is the senior class, and that's how it should, that, that's how it should be. The senior class should make the final decision, not, not the adults in this matter. But um, um, to you, Ms. Uh, Superintendent Kwong, is there a date for grade eight or you're still working on that? So that's something that the grammar school principals and I are still working through with the parents and staff at the, at the grammar schools, what okay. the final assembly will look like. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Barn. Thank you. And so member Nicholson has a question. Yes, thank you, May. It's not a question, it's a, just a comment. I'd like to add my thanks also to uh, Principal Baden, to Superintendent Kwong, um, and all of the other administrators who helped uh, to drive the survey, uh, who uh, were responsible for distributing it, collating it. Um, I think it's wonderful that we have this feedback. Um, I commend um, the work that they did. Uh, I commend the students' involvement, and I think it's a wonderful idea to plan for uh, both a virtual graduation and an in-person graduation. So thank you for all that you've been doing and you will continue to do in the next weeks and months ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll just pile on Mr. Barton and say, I fully support and so the city, you know, gives you any support you need. Uh, I do think it's important that you plan a range of options and I'll say, you know, we're looking at July 4th the same way, right? So do we do virtual versus all the way to, you know, depending on what happens with the state. And so the next couple of weeks are gonna dictate a lot for us all. Uh, so, you know, we fully support you and whatever help you need, let us know. Thank you very much. Thank you. So is, okay, if there's good. no, yeah, is there anybody else with questions? I, I, I'm gonna take this as you have, we have your support to move forward so the high school team can announce this to the parents and students and staff and start planning with his administrative team and students. Um, I see nods. So fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Your team is definitely, this is, this is work isn't done. 
but making a decision at least now gets us gets us to an end point where we'll make sure that we're doing everything we can for the students. So thank you. By the time by the time you finish this decision, Mr. Biden, we expect that to be a ZZ top beard, right? So it's the class of 2020 beard, actually. There you go. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> Caitlin liked that. I just saw her laugh a little thank bit. That was you. good. <laughs> okay, Superintendent, you want to keep going? Yeah, Before all right, thank I you, Mr. Barden. All right, thank so oh. all right, so um I'm done with the COVID update. Unless you guys have questions, then we can move on to 4B. Okay. All right, so 4B we added today, and this was a um I apologize for the last minute decision, but the mayor and I uh, felt both felt that this was uh, important to add tonight to the school committee agenda. Um, he and I met this afternoon with all of the union heads for the entire city. So all of the municipal union leaders and the school union leaders. And the sheet that was uh, sent to you by Dodie, uh, probably around four o'clock, uh, that was the sheet that we gave them and those were our talking points. And so we felt that it was important that we uh, go over this a little bit with you all tonight um, and really uh, make sure that everybody here understands the, the position that we're in, which is uh, uncertain at best. Um, but, but also knowing, as I said to you all last Monday evening that on May 18th, I do anticipate we are working to be able to present to all of you what a level funded budget would look like and what has been removed from the budget um, to get to a level funded budget. Um, because as uh, I believe I stated last last week, um, you know, level funded means the exact same dollar amount. So any increase in contractual services, uh, uh, collective bargaining agreements, uh, tuitions for out of district tuitions that are out of our control, um, we have to find ways to reduce the budget back down to 80 million, uh, 80.9 million. Uh, that would give us level funding first. So these are the things that we're working on now, which I will be presenting to you on May 18th. Um, but we really just, the mayor and I just wanted an opportunity to, to uh, address these two points and a couple things to be really clear on this, the school piece. Um, I had a conversation with Linda Dean Campbell. I believe the mayor's talked to Linda Dean Campbell and she was on his show tonight. Um, so we're, we're talking constantly with our legislative um, representatives about what's happening. And the first couple bullets there about the facts that we know um, you know, those two facts are, the mayor can certainly speak to the projections in the city revenue um, being less, 5.7 million less than uh, what would be anticipated. Um, and the Linda Dean Campbell shared with us about the $2.4 billion uh, less in revenue from April for one month. And so as a state, they're not really expecting May to look much better um, and really advising us. Uh, and I think she said it even tonight um, with you, Mayor, and said it definitely to me is, you know, plan for level funding and, and then some, um, because we, we, the uncertainty behind this is, is unfortunate for us. Um, Massachusetts has been hit very hard. So um, for us, and the, the question I really asked her, which was really important to me um, and to all of you is, well, what's happening with the chapter 70 formula? Because we just got so excited about this change in the formula and the Student Opportunity Act and the increase in funding or, or, or programming. Um, and right now there is absolutely no conversation at the state level about chapter 70 funding formulas and what that's gonna look like because there are no numbers at the state level. So that was made very clear to me. And so I just wanna make that very clear to all of you. We made that clear today to the union leaders. I've certainly stated that um, before to all of you, um, you know, the Student Opportunities Act, the plan that I submitted uh, is pretty much gone for this school year. Uh, it's a great plan and it will be it will be waiting and ready when we're able to get that back. Um, you know, but this year's budget is going to be a completely different ball game from that. Um, and our hope is to uh, eliminate as much as we can without laying off anybody because that's our last resort and that's what we discussed today. Um, so you can see from the memo, everything on that memo is what we transparency, we just we talked about it with all the union leaders today um, and so we are looking for we will begin impact bargaining with the school department units uh, Colleen and I and Mike Maccaro will be doing that um, to impact you know pay freezes 
uh, things like that that might impact what's going to happen next, for next year so we can make some budget decisions because uh, it's it's going to next Monday believe it or not was supposed to be our public hearing for our budget um, so talk about timing right we're not even close to that I'm going to be instead I'm going to be presenting to you how we got to or how we're going to get to a level funded budget for next year at the school department um, you know and so we're we're all of us, I think every municipality is pushed back. I think the state has waived, I believe, Mayor, you will know this more than I do, the, the time, the time. if the state doesn't have a budget, then our timelines obviously have been waived um, to make sure that we, you know, we're not gonna be required to have public hearings and have a budget if the state doesn't have a budget first. Right. Um, so, you know, we'll catch up to that when we, when we can. Um, but it's just, an, it is remarkable what has changed since the first time we talked about the budget uh, in the past two months. So um, that was really our intent tonight is we, we wanted to share that with you. We wanted to be transparent. Um, I will be sending a video message to my staff tomorrow. Um, now that we've talked to the union leaders, we're sharing it with you tonight. And I think the staff in Methuen needs to hear that direct, uh, the Methuen Public Schools needs to hear this directly from me, what's happening. Um, you know, I, I did state today in the meeting that we were in together that um, this community, as a whole has gone through way too much the past three years. Um, and we're gonna do everything we can to make sure that that people don't suffer more than they have to and that this is not what we wanna do. Um, but we also have to be fiscally responsible and make sure that people understand the process. And that's gonna be my job and the mayor's job and our job together to make sure that we're informing people what we, what we need to have happen and what we wanna do and then um, you know, as we get numbers, which I don't know, could be in two weeks, could be in six weeks, uh, could be in two months. Um, yep. You know, we just really don't know. And I think the, the reps have been helpful in at least telling us that, like, there's, there's not an end date to this right now that they can give us when they'll have a budget. Um, so that's the, that's the object of tonight. And I know um, I didn't have FY21 on the agenda uh, because I anticipated, you know, sharing on next Monday night the a level funded budget and talking about the budget solely next Monday night um, and where we were. But we both felt it was important that we had this conversation today where we had that meeting with the union leadership. Um, yeah. So, Mayor, I don't know if you want to add to that. No, and then, and I think you did a great job. So, I, I think the, you know, uh, we talked to as superintendent all the union reps, city and school side. Um, you know, superintendent's going to send a video message out. I'll meet with all employees tomorrow to kind of make sure everybody's on the same page, right? And so this is all about how do we accomplish what we need to accomplish to stay in the box um, and not impact jobs. And that was really the, the tone of the message today. And I think it was well received, to be honest with you. So, um, you know, my compliments to the superintendent for kind of working with me to kind of pull this off and, and bring them together. Now we just have to bargain with these folks. Um, and I, but I think they understand, you know, the dilemma we're in. This is, you know, we said to them is this is not where we anticipated we would be at this point in the year, but it is what it is. And so we'll, we'll deal with what we know and try to move forward as best we can. And so uh, I, I saw the meeting as extremely positive and I know you did too, Superintendent. So um, it's an important first step. Agreed. So I don't know if folks have questions or comments about this piece, um, but do know that I that is our team is working on presenting all of you uh, a, a level funded budget. So what does the budget look like and what have we taken out of the budget basically to get to level funding? That's what we're gonna present to you next Monday. Yep. We have Member, some DeZoglio, Member DeZoglio has his hand raised, so. You're on mute. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, um, um, Superintendent Kwong, and um, I did receive um, issues involving one of um, our workers. Um, I've actually received several, and they wanted me to make sure that I voice this publicly, and committee member uh, Nicholson can follow up with me if I miss anything. Um, there are people that are on relief right now that are received notice from their doctors that they should not be working during COVID because of other pre-existing health. I've looked up um, the laws and I saw that they are supposed to be on unpaid, um, on paid leave for up to a certain amount of time, but has there been things worked out with that um, 
Um, I'm going to say the cafeteria workers um, union. Has there been um, things worked out with them, in, especially today, in regards to concerns? With those so, types of people? Yep. So thank you, Member Zaglio. So I did speak to uh, Member Nicholson as well. And I think um, some of the confusion is coming in that um, the CARES Act is very specific to what the paid leave is, and it's for leave related to COVID illness. So it's if you are ill with COVID or if you're in quarantine due to COVID or you're home because you have children home due to COVID, those are, those are very specific issues dealing with the CARES Act and paid leave. If people have doctor's notes, and we have it in every unit, not just the cafeteria, mm -hmm. but if we have people who have doctor's notes saying they can't work because they're high risk or whatever it may be, whatever illness they have, and they have access to their own sick time, they do have to use their own sick time. So that's actually what's happening right now. And every sick note, I just asked Colleen to jump on too. So she's here in case I'm saying this wrong, but she's going to mm -hmm. be here for the next uh, item as well. Hi, Colleen. Thank you. So Colleen, I'm just talking about um, the CARES Act and people having to take sick leave. So if I'm misspeaking at all, I just want you to jump in. Um, but that's happening in all the units, uh, Member Desaglio, not necessarily just uh, the, the lunch. So if people have sick leave, then we are, we are obligated to have them utilize their, their own sick time. That's what's happening right now. And we do, we have teachers in that position. We have, because um, you know, we have people in that position in all of our units right now that are sick and cannot work. Um, and they're, they're, they, need to, they, they need to take their own sick time if they have access to it. Um, so I, I believe that was what the concern was. So member Nicholson and member Desaglio, correct me if I'm wrong, um, if, that was, if there was more to that than, than I'm saying right now. Um, but the, the CARES Act leave is very specific and it's very limited. It's not, you know, it's not un, indefinite time of, um, of leave. You know, it's very specific to 14 days if you're sick, 14 days if it's quarantine, uh, two thirds of pay if you're, you're home with children. Um, so the federal law is very clear on what we need to do. And I know uh, Colleen and I definitely have been, every single doctor's note that we get, every single leave uh, that we have in question, um, we are running it by uh, attorney Macaro to make sure that we are not, um, you know, we're not messing around with this and not taking a chance that we're going to um, misstep. So uh, he is reviewing every doctor's note as well to make sure that, or situation to make sure that we um, are handling it correctly in the district. Uh, thank you. And a uh, follow-up question also, I just, I was also reading um, the American Disabilities Act because I actually fall underneath that at my own workplace. Are we, are we, are we following that as well? Because I just don't know how COVID and American Disabilities Act could come, because I know the American uh, CARES Act is different, but I was just saying, is the district following the American Disabilities Act as well? Because I can see some, I've, I've seen also people tell me that, that they were confused with the two laws and trying to kind of put them together. So I wanted that to be public too tonight that are we following both guidelines of both um, laws right now, or is it just COVID CARES Act law right now? So I'm gonna say, of course, we're following every federal law. I will certainly, Colleen, if you wanna just co confirm that, but we are following every uh, law that we have to for employment, um, Colleen. Correct. Um, by allowing an employee to take sick time, and to not make any changes to their employment um, by means of letting them go is a, an accommodation under the ADA at which our attorneys have advised us that we are doing the right thing by under the CBA, if the doctor's note meets the criteria allowing people to utilize their sick leave. Oh, and, and I, I'm, I'm sure that we are following. I just wanted to make sure it was public. So, because I know there are people watching this tonight. Um, but I also want to ask um, one more uh, question that I had. And um, a lot of people were being told that they were to go and seek unemployment, that they, they were told that they would not be able to re, um, Re, um, re, 
get their job back by seniority. So I wanted to make sure is that was that actually said to them or is that just hearsay? That was not said by anybody in my office. So I'm, I'm going to go with that was probably hearsay. Could have been from the union. I have no idea. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. I think it's important when we have questions like that, member Dezog, though, to kind of know who, who, what, what group we're talking about. Where, where's the question coming from, right? So I, I would find it hard to believe that, you know, we're we're talking specific terms like that with specific groups. We'd have to kind of narrow it down. So to talk in generalities to me is a little bit kind of disturbing. We need to kind of focus on what group is is talking about it. I, so I, if you can. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Mayor, I just said the cafeteria workers. Oh, you did? Okay, I didn't hear that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, any other questions on uh, the FY21 discussion or anything COVID-19 related that came in section four? I don't see any other hands raised. So uh, we will move on. So that takes us to old business and other pending matters. And we have a motion to reconsider the hourly pay for crossing guards per member Hallbauer. Did you want a motion for that member Hallbauer? Yes, I do. I'd like to make a motion to revisit the vote that uh, we took last Monday night. Um, it was about extending the hourly pay for the 16 crossing guards through the remainder of the school year. And I think if, um, if we all recall, it was, we were divided on the issue. And can, I, can I stop you for a minute, Member Halbauer? Yeah. So, so we've got a. So you motioned. We need a second to motion before we start discussing. If you second. would, second by Member Dezaglio. Thank you. Go ahead, Member Halbauer. Sorry. All right. So at that time that we took that vote, um, I was undecided. I I don't think that um, that I was as informed as I could have been, and I didn't feel comfortable voting yes or no. So I voted what I thought would be a neutral present. But as it turns out, my vote of present was not neutral. It was consequential because it tipped the balance of the vote. And ultimately, um, that, that vote failed. Um, so since that time, I had a conversation with the superintendent and I've had a, a clearer understanding of the, um, the financial and also the human impact that, that that failed vote has on the district. And um, based on that, I would like to amend my vote. So I don't know if, if it's a simple question of me, me personally amending my vote or does everyone, do we do a whole vote again? I think it has to be reconsidered. Okay. So I I'd think like that's the, the motion on the floor. So the motion on the floor is to reconsider. We're in the discussion phase. Uh, Member Pesci has her hand raised as well. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Member Halbauer, for bringing this forward. Um, I too, I think there was a lot of confusion around that chart we received last time, um, and I, I'm not placing the fault on it, but I have to say just for the record that I was under the impression that these people, that there really wasn't work to do for them. Um, now I'm getting different um, uh, information that they are working, you know, their hours, they are being asked to do things outside of the things that were even listed, you know, necessarily on that mm -hmm. sheet. Um, the way it was broken up, and I don't know if the public was given that sheet, but it was like this or that. So I assumed it was like a choice, like there wasn't one, there was another, but it was actually a split in the employees. Not everybody necessarily was doing one or the other, if I'm being clear at all. Yeah. Um, and on, in our packet tonight on page 50, um, the figures are there. I mean, the, yeah. there's, um, I don't know if the superintendent wants to speak a little bit on this, but um, I, what you're saying is, is basically what I was feeling on Monday when I took the vote too, but yeah, I'm, I'm more informed right now. I have a better understanding and actually um, it will have an adverse impact on the <coughs> district if that vote fails to pass, to continue yeah. to pay them. And, and just to just to end um, this thought too, I am 100% for paying any employee hourly per diem regular as long as they are working. Um, and I know we originally, when we voted way back in March, 
to extend the pay just for that, whatever it was, that two weeks, that we had a particular verbiage um, that went along with it. So I don't know if this is the proper platform or not, but if we can um, have that verbiage as well put into this and add, um, if the mayor's okay, I think he is too, if, um, you know, as long as they accept work as required by the school or the city side as needed or as requested, um, so that if, if things come up on either side, we can get these people, if they're ready, willing, and able to work, and we are giving them different job opportunities to fulfill the duties that they're, we're in fact paying them for, then I, I really, it's kind of a moot point for me. So I, I'm okay with that. So I, I think, yeah, thank you for, for that. So yeah, the page 50, I think outlines a little bit better that particular group and why there was concern. And I know, I, again, I, I, I appreciate Karen, the com or member have our, the conversation we had. Um, there was a lot happening that night, a lot of different groups and different reasons and what people were doing. So I do understand that that, that was a lot and it was confusing. Um, but as you can see here, the crossing guards are very unique in the sense that that money is non-net. And so there's, absolute, there's actually a cost to the district. We would end up paying uh, unemployment through the day they get employed again. So that would be through the summer. It's not just the 35 days they're out of school. It's from now until September 1st. And so that's where we've incurred the cost and that anything we save isn't a savings for the school department. Sorry, Mayor. But it goes right back to the city. So we actually will incur a $29,000 cost, the school department, to pay unemployment. Um, whereas if we just paid them, what we're paying the $20,000 and we don't have that additional fee for the unemployment. Right. Um, and you know, so and, it, and this, this right. is also a, um, a human impact too because Absolutely. they might take jobs somewhere else and you'd be in a position where we'd have to hire crossing guards again. Absolutely, and I would say this to you, all of you, and, and Colleen knows better than anybody, um, it, crossing guards are one of the toughest uh, jobs to fill in the district because of the hours and where they are, and they're very, and it's limited, right? It's hourly pay, and it's three hours here and three hours here, and it's not full time. Um, so we try to allow some of our staff to do multiple different things like that so they can get you know, a decent paycheck um, but it is the hardest job to fill. And if, if we don't have crossing guards, the principals, the principals are crossing guards. That's who goes out and asks us crossing guards in front of the schools is our principals. Yeah, Member um, Pesci you know, still- so that's, that's a tough one yeah. for us. So Member Pesci still has her hand raised. I don't think she finished. No, just one last, I, I know this is kind of, <laughs> everyone's got things to say. Um, just one last, one last question. I think I'll direct this to Colleen actually. I just want to make sure that going forward with any of these um, employees, any of our employees, that we're reconciling as well that we're, they're not receiving unemployment as well. I know that seems like kind of a silly question, but the way the unemployment is now, you can still make a certain amount of money and collect as per the way the state wrote um, the, co the, the COVID you know, guidelines. So I just want to make sure that we're reconciling that nobody's double dipping as well. Absolutely. And if anyone shows up on our bill that we are continuing to pay, we have the option to protest. Great. That's all I want to hear. I am done, Mayor. I will raise yep. my hand. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Member Dezoglo has his hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And also, I just want to thank um, Committee Member Halbar for bringing this back up as, as last week I was very um, vocal about letting go of these people. Uh, but I also believe in fiscal, uh, uh, the verbiage that um, Vice Chair um, Committee Pesh, I agree with her. But also I, I wanna be careful because if we take jobs on the city side and we're paying them school, um, the school budget, I don't know if that's a conflict. I don't think we can do that. So we would have to, am I correct, Mr. Mayor? You couldn't use you can't use school budget money to fund a position to do city jobs. Is that correct? Well, you could repurpose them for vol um, volunteer type activities like a Methuen Care Center, things like that. Okay. Um, you, could, I, you could have them calling our, our elderly population and things of that nature. So those are all things that could be done. 
Okay. And Perfect. what our nurses have done. So our nurses have yeah. been repurposed Correct. this entire time to support, you know, they're still working on school stuff, but they're supporting the Department of Public Health. Yeah. Um, and definitely we're doing that. I don't yeah. want to say and full time, but I'm going to say full time through the yeah. month. Pretty, of pretty close yeah. to full time. So yeah. we would not be getting by as a city without those school nurses. So yep. that, that was, you know, a, a team effort too. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Thank so you. Do we, do we take a, another vote or do I just yeah. amend will, my so, so we'll put it to, we'll take up. So the motion on the floor is to reconsider the hourly pay of crossing guards. So um, we're going to vote on whether we, we pay the crossing guards or not is the motion on the floor. Okay. So, Mayor, I'm nope. sorry. Can I just can I just Please. add for Jana's point? Um, it should be the same exact language that they um, that they are whatever we used last time. I'm sorry, Colleen or Doty, um, that uh, that we're going to pay them as long as they uh, re, you know work on a rotating basis as needed. Uh, that same language that we had. I think that was the correct. Point that, that Member Zani was trying to make. Yep, I agree, one thousand percent. So having said that, Dodie, can we go to a roll call? This is, so so just so that we're all on the same page, the motion on the floor is to uh, pay the crossing guards provided they, and superintendent, you can hit the language there, provided they work. Um, that they, they, um, you want me to help they you? Agree, they agree to work as uh, requested or, or needed. Yep. Is that, we yeah, either that or we have to look up the motion. We should have typed the actual motion I, from the last time. Uh, Superintendent, I have it, Mayor. Oh, yeah. perfect. Yeah, yep. as, <clears throat> as long as they contribute hours as needed or required by the district. Correct. Yes. Perfect. So that's the motion on the floor to pay the crossing guards provided they work as needed. So, Doe, do you want to do the roll? Ryan DeZoglio? Yes. Karen Hallbauer? Yes. Jessica McLeod. Yes. Susan Nicholson. She's muted. <laughs> yeah, you muted member Nicholson. Member Nicholson, you're muted. I think she's trying to find the unmute. <laughs> Come back to her, Dodie. Yeah. This year. She's, this year. she's, 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 she's Yes. Yep. Luanne Santos. Yes. Jane Azani Pesh. Yes. And Man Neil Perry. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, that takes us on to uh, the budget calendar dates and times. Is this a discussion, Superintendent? Yeah. So I think um, we want to look at uh, we have a meeting next Monday night, um, which I know is a conflict for the mayor. Um, and I would say this to all of you. Now that there are no uh, school events happening in the evenings from now until the end of school, uh, the day of the week of school committee meetings is, you know, we, we have our pick of days. Um, I'm wondering if the committee would be amenable to moving any additional meetings to Tuesdays um, so that the mayor could join us because it would be a conflict of city council uh, and his uh, live show. So I, I, two things, if we wanna move next Monday's meeting to Tuesday evening, um, so that in hopes that the mayor could join us. And then uh, I do believe that we should actually schedule weekly meetings through the month of June. I, I, I know it's a lot, but I think that with the changing dynamics of everything happening right now, I think it's best that we have scheduled weekly meetings um, so that if we need to transfer funds, new updates on the budget um, numbers coming out, we have those already on people's schedules. So um, I didn't know if any of the ones that we don't already have we have Monday meetings already scheduled, um, but any additional meetings? So it would be the May 18th meeting was an additional add-on and it is a conflict with the city council. Am I correct, Mayor? It is, right? Yeah. And, um, and then any Monday meetings in June would be a conflict. So if we added two more meetings in June between the business meeting and the workshop and another one at the end of the month, um, that's really what I was hoping for tonight. And we could do it on a Tuesday. And we could do it at five o'clock, maybe. Yeah, I'm nodding. We like that. So a five o'clock meeting would be um, also doable because we don't have uh, events happening. If that works Correct. for other folks as well. Member Dzoglo has a. 
Yeah, like I said earlier, um, the only thing I'm concerned about is the I scheduled my final semester at Merrimack on Tuesdays, my classes, because of our meetings on Monday. So, at, and they're usually at six o'clock. So if we have remote learn, um, these meetings, I'll be basically switching back and forth between class and this, but also if Merrimack opens up, I don't know how, I just don't want to miss these meetings, obviously. It doesn't so. have to be a Tuesday. I mean, it can be a Thursday, I think is would be an, another night that it doesn't conflict with the mayor. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be Tuesday. I picked Tuesday just because it's the next day, but um, it could be weekly meetings on a Thursday um, in June as well. And we can change next week's meeting or leave next week's meeting. It, it doesn't matter. I just... Well, no, my, my semester doesn't start until the, I think the following week, um, okay. I, I got to check, but the classes are Tuesday and Thursday because it's a quick, the summer session one, summer session two. So again, I, I this is my own thing. I'll work it out. I just, I just want to know if, if, if I'm in remote, we're here doing this, I'll be switching back and forth. It's whatever works for the rest of the committee, but I'll be hearing you as I'm listening to class and switching, I'll figure it out. I just wanna make sure people know like that's my only conflict with that. But next week should be fine. Next Tuesday should be fine for me. All right, do we wanna start there? Is our people amenable to moving uh, the meeting to May 19th at five o'clock? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Mayor, does that, you think that works for you better, right? It, it works, yes. Okay, so um, Jody, do we need to take a vote or are we just changing calendars right now? I don't think we need to take a vote. We don't have to take a vote, do we? She's talking, yeah, no. Okay, so May 19th, we'll move that um, to five o'clock. And then we will be presenting the Elsibia budget workshop. We'll be presenting uh, what, what, what we have done to create a level funded budget for the school department. Um, so that would be, the topic will be the FY21 budget next week. Um, all right, and then the, the meetings in June. So we should add one. Um, let me just look at my calendar to look at the weeks and then we can, so we already have one scheduled for the 26th. So we'll keep that one. Um, that's not a conflict for you, mayor, correct? Nope. So we'll keep the 26th at 630. Um, and then, so we have June, the week is June 1st. So I don't, I don't know how we want to do that. Does the team want to do Tuesdays? Do we want to keep Mondays? So if we keep Mondays, we don't have the mayor. If we do Tuesday, Thursday, we're going to lose Ryan at about six o'clock, it sounds like. Tuesday, Friday. Oh. <laughs> Member Santos, did you say Friday? School committee meetings. Yeah. Oh, and listen, it's okay. Whatever is easy for anyone. I'm pretty flexible right now. So I'm open to anything. Well, the mayor still has his show on Fridays, right, okay. mayor? I do. I'm open I just think to it's whatever important to have him present as we're talking about budget, and there's so many change, so many moving parts. Yeah, I, ap I apologize, right. sir, but yeah, I'd like to be there. Does he have a school city council meeting? I mean, that Tuesday. It's after Memorial Day. No. What do you? That think? was our regular meeting. At Tuesday, the 26th, we already have it scheduled. I'm looking at the week of June 1st. Yeah. How about the Wednesdays? Because that wouldn't conflict with Ryan's classes, right? No, it would not. But it would, have, would that interfere with you, Mr. Mayor? No, as long as we start at 6 o'clock, uh, at 6.15. I need 15 minutes to get someplace. <laughs> so. so if we do Wednesdays, we can keep the 6.30 time. Yep. Which is also fine. I'm good with that. You guys want to, so June 3rd, 6.30? Yeah. And then our regular business meeting is June 8th. So we're going to keep that at 6.30. And then, so the only other one we should schedule is the week of June 15th. Do we want to do Wednesday at 6.30? Mm -hmm. So it'd be June 17th. Is that? That works. June 17th at 6.30. And then we already have one scheduled for the 22nd. Uh, 
I don't know if we should schedule one for the week of, of June 29th, July 1st, but we probably should at least have it booked. Um, yeah, I think that's going to be an interesting week. So, um, we might actually, have the graduation. Uh, we might have the graduation that week, right? What's that? No, that's no. That's Graduation's the 31st. The July. July 31st, sorry. Okay. Yeah, yep, yep. I'm thinking we should probably do the, the 29th. I don't think I want to do it on July 1st, just in case there's something that needs to be done prior to July 1st. I, I agree okay. with that. Yeah. Okay, so July 29th, I mean, June 29th, and we'll keep it at 6.30. Mm -hmm. sure. All right, Dodie will send out all of that. Everybody. That's great, thank you very much. Thank you guys though for working around me, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's this. Is Is they working around me. What do you want to get an education or something? Come on now. Yeah, I'm unbelievable. <laughs> okay. Um, that move takes us on to new business, unless we have any other questions on the calendar. Uh, may I have a motion to accept the first read of the revised and readopted BEDH public participation guidelines for public comment? So moved. Moved by Member Pesci. I need a second. 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 Second by Member DiZoglio. Discussion. So is this only going to be during obviously COVID, correct? This, Mayor, if I can speak, this I had asked to bring this on. Thank you. You may. Uh, so this would be this would be policy regardless of COVID or not. The only thing I'm asking for is um, a remote participation addendum to it, if you will. Okay. So if, if we ever would need to participate remotely, um, I mean, think about it, even snow dates, we could try this again, I guess, going forward, right? We wouldn't have to miss the date necessarily. Um, last, last meeting, we had a lot of participation. And while I love to see participation come in, um, a lot of it was, was very long and went way over the five minute limit. Um, that we would have allowed had they come into, you know, into a meeting in person. So I was trying to approximate basically what would be reasonable time um, for someone reading, which would be that five minute equivalent. So I just suggested that um, it should be, you know, a single space page and 12 point or larger. The only addition that's not on this sheet, and I don't know if it's redundant or not, those public participations we received, and I don't know all of them, I don't have in front of them last week, they did not have the name and address of the person speaking. So the only other thing I would ask on number seven, even though it's redundant, is to also, um, Jody, maybe if we can add it, just to add um, after 12 font point or larger, must include name and address requirements as set forth in number two. Okay. So basically, if we're communicating remotely, we have this. If not, it just becomes it, it becomes uh, irrelevant. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and I guess um, I don't know how I said this, Member Pesci. It, um, as long as the governor's doesn't issue an order that countermands anything he's issued, right? So, as long as when the new normal comes, whenever that is, that he doesn't issue an order that precludes. That, right, so I, I, I agree with you a thousand percent. So, do we go to a vote, Dodie? First read, yep. I don't see, uh, excuse me, Ryan has his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put my hand up. I'm sorry, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm, I'm trying that was from you're still up. There you go. All right, Dodie, can we go to a roll call, please? <laughs> okay, Ryan DeZoglio. It's just, it keeps going up. Um, yes. Karen Halbauer. Yes. Jessica McLeod. Yes. Susan Nicholson. Yes. Luanne Santos. Yes. Jane Azani Petch. Yes. Mayor Neil Perry. Yes. Unanimous. Okay, that takes us into. Uh, the memorandum of agreement with unit A. I need a motion to approve before we can discuss. So uh, moved. Moved second. by Member Nicholson. I need a second. Second. Second by Member DeZoglio. Discussion. Any hands on this? Um, I don't see any. 
No questions on this. Wow, you guys surprised me. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, I guess we're ready for a roll call there, Dodi. Ryan DeZoglio? Yes. Karen Halbauer? Yes. Jessica McLeod? Yes. Susan Nicholson? Yes. Julian Santos? Yes. Dana Zani Pesh? Yes. And Manuel Perry? Yes, unanimous, nice job team. Okay, that takes us to finance and operations reports. Ian, Ian, do you wanna report out on anything? You wanna just roll through? Uh, roll through, if there's any questions, I'll feel free, uh, feel free to ask any questions, I'll answer them. Yep, so the expenditure report. <clears throat> Does the committee have any questions? He waits, he pauses, he breathes. <laughs> he sees no questions. Let's move on. The revolving funds report. Does the committee have any questions on the revolving funds report? Oh, um, <laughs> Remember, uh, yeah, no, I'm looking, at my, I'm looking at my questions and I'm trying to get synchronized here. Um, do, has the refunds? I had um, uh, one question from parents when the refunds were going out. I know we discussed it. I think it was a week ago. It was going to be two weeks. Is that still scheduled? I've been working. I've been working with the principals, and I sent them out a spreadsheet okay. so as, they, as they submit. Um, so, for example, we got a spreadsheet from the Cheney for our bowling, the bowling club, and we had to re refund some of their money that came in. Those X have been cut. Um, we're in the process of putting them in envelopes and mailing them out. So, as they come in, we're trying to get them out as soon as possible. Thank you. Ian. Any other questions on the revolving funds? Seeing or hearing none, let's move on. The grants report. Does the committee have any questions on the grants report? Looking and seeing none, we'll move on. And that takes us to the student activity account. Does the committee have any questions? All right, so let's move on. And finally, uh, the food services. Does the committee have any questions on the food services amounts? Uh, Member Pesci has her hand raised. Thanks, I just wanna ask, I, I apologize. I'm looking on my other computer. Um, I didn't wanna, this was a 92 page packet. So I'm trying yep. to look at yep. it, printing it out. Um, do yep. we have an update on the, the meals debt? Are they still working on that? I know they were. I just, um, I was looking for it and I didn't find it. It might be on this. The meal debt I did not include because it has not changed. We have not chased anyone down for money in the middle of the COVID. Um, we thought it would be a little tone deaf to chase people for money right at this well, point. Well, not chasing people for money, Ian, but I'm thinking, um, is, is Paula still making calls to see if these people qualify for free reduced lunches? Because I don't want to bother people during COVID, but we also know their home, number one. And two, if we can get that retroactively set up going forward for the fall semester, it would be helpful. I have the, the new report filled out. It's essentially the same. I will send it to you guys first thing tomorrow. Okay, thank yeah. you. So, so let, me, uh, uh, let me ask a question here since you brought it up, Member Pesci. Uh, so Ian, can you roll a negative balance into the next fiscal year on this? No, the school department will need to pay the food services department to make them whole. So whatever the debt is at the end of the fiscal year, school department has to refund them. Those are federal guidelines. And what is the debt right now? It's a little bit over $9,000. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Are you, do you still have a question, Member Pesci? Your hand's still up. Yep. <laughs> okay. Any other questions on food services? Okay, let's move forward. Notification of appointments and other personnel matters. There are none to be discussed. So that takes us to business from the committees. So do we have a residency subcommittee update? Or sure, I'll do that, Mayor. Um, we did meet remotely, I think what was uh, a couple of weeks ago now. And um, I think we'll schedule another meeting soon. Basically our meeting revolved around what we can do now that um, school has been closed obviously till the end of the year. Um, and I think the focus of the committee was that we wanna focus on the policies 
and how to best update those and change those to make our residency policies a little more stringent uh, going forward uh, into the new year. Okay. Any questions for the subcommittee? Hearing or seeing none, uh, we will move on. Any other business from any other committees? I don't know that we have any yet, right? Do we have any member hope? Okay, no. Okay, having done that, uh, I'm gonna ask for a motion to go into executive session. Uh, I need a motion to go into executive session. So moved, Mayor. Moved by Member Nicholson, seconded by Member Pesci. So we have a first and a second motion to go into executive session pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares. All units and to discuss potential tort litigation threatened against the school committee. We will not reconvene into an open session at the conclusion of the executive session. Madam Secretary, can you call the roll? Ryan DeZoglio. You're muted, Ryan. You're muted, Ryan. Yeah, yeah yes. Karen Harbauer. Yes. Jessica McLeod. Yes. Susan Nicholson. Yes. Marian Santos. Yes. Dana Zani Pesh. Yes. Mia Neil Perry. Yes. So the meeting is adjourned at 8.28 p.m. and we will now move into the, uh, I think we have a second invite, don't we, Superintendent? You do, you just got one from Colleen McCarthy, I believe. Okay, so yeah, uh, log off and see you yeah. on the other side, folks. Okay. Good night. I will, respectfully, I will not be attending executive session due to um, personal matters that um, Superintendent Kwan can explain. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, take care. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. So the invitation didn't come through yet. <laughs>